welcome, welcome. Um, for those of you who have been here before, welcome back. And for those new names in there, uh, welcome. We are the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach, Florida. And unfortunately, right now we are closed. We are a pretty small facility, um, so it's not possible for us to open just yet. Um, but our goal is to always educate the public um, and whoever's interested about environmental and marine science concerns um, and conservation efforts. So we decided to start this really cool webinar series where we can uh, educate everyone on a variety of topics. We've reached out to all of our awesome science friends all over the world. Um, and today we are lucky enough to be working with our very own marine environmental uh, educator, Carly Todd. Um, Carly has been at the Meek for a year and a half now? Yep. Yeah, a year and a half now. Um, Hi, man. And she has been here. She's expanded our programming exponentially, I think by 400%, something ridiculous like that. Um, she is wise beyond her years in so many different topics. Um, and today she is going to be teaching us all about mangrove ecosystems. Um, so right now everyone is muted. Um, and everyone's video is off. It's gonna be like that for the duration of the program, just so you can most clearly hear and see Carly and her presentation. Uh, but if you do have any questions, comments, concerns, issues, please throw them into that chat. I will be monitoring the chat for the whole program. Um, and then Carly will get to any questions or concerns at the end. Um, if for some reason I'm not seeing you in the chat, there is also that little raise hand button. So raise your hand and we'll be able to unmute you from here. Um, I think that is everything from me. So whenever you're ready, Carly, feel free to take it away. Taylor, thank you so much for that introduction. Oof, I am ready. So hello, I am Carly. Uh, I am the education coordinator here at the Meek. And like Taylor said, uh, one of the big, big things that I have done in my time here is really expand what we're offering um, because the ocean just has so many cool things and the surrounding environments um, have so many cool things. And just the interconnectedness of this planet is just really cool to highlight um, just everything out there. So today we're going to be talking about mangroves. It is my third favorite tree. Um, they're really, really unique and we are lucky enough here in Florida to have them. Um, so let me get this share screen going and we can get on our way. Uh, I will keep an eye on the chat as we go along. Sometimes I get very excited and I tend to talk faster. So if I do talk too fast, please just let me know. Like I said, I get super excited and sometimes it's hard for me to reel it in. Um, so like I said, today we're talking about mangroves. So mangroves, unlike most trees, they're, it's really interesting because they are just a general characterization. Um, so it's actually a group of about 54 true species of trees, um, but in total there are about 80 species that scientists will recognize. Um, and the reason why these guys are all grouped together is because of their ability to live in a tropical area and to actually live in water. Um, so and like survive and thrive. So they are able to live in anoxic, which means not a lot of oxygen in the soil, brackish water, which is that mixture of fresh and salt water. Um, so usually where rivers release into the ocean, um, so kind of estuary areas. Um, it's also characterized by salty water. Uh, so brackish water, the salinity will be anywhere from 0.5 parts per thousand all the way up to 35 parts per thousand. Um, so it could get, it could get pretty salty. Um, and also in that area, it's also uh, the estuary, it's also the intertidal zone. So that means that at low tides, the water will be super low and at high tides, the water will be super high. So these trees are really, really sturdy things just because they can tolerate all of these different um, changes in their daily lives. Because um, some places they'll have just one high tide and one low tide a day, whereas some places like a mixed semi-diurnal tide they'll have two high tides and two low tides every day. Um, one unique thing about these guys is that they only are found in the tropics. So they only will grow between 25 degrees north and 25 degrees south for the latitudes. Oh, I have a question already. I'm talking too fast. Oh, it's just Taylor. We'll ignore it. Um, so this map right here just shows you um, how where they're found throughout the world. So you can see kind of along the equator um, and how many species are found there. So we are gonna be in the top left, my mouse, there it is, um, top left right around here. So we actually don't have too many species here in uh, Florida and specifically in the Americas. Now, if we were to look over in the Indo-Pacific where all the really cool things are in all aspects of life, um, there is much higher biodiversity there. So that's where you'll find up to 50 plus different species of mangroves. All right, so like I said, surviving and thriving. 
Um, these guys, they're the bridge between the aquatic world and the terrestrial world, uh, just because they do grow in the water, but they also require soil. So they kind of bridge those two together. Uh, it's really important that we have mangroves because they help transfer energy and matter between those two food webs um, and help recycle nutrients. And I'll touch on that in a moment. So because the area where they're living is always changing um, because of the tides, because of rainfall, things like that, they have specific adaptations that allow them to survive in these areas. So like I said, anoxic soil is low oxygenated soil. Um, so their root system actually reflects that. So these roots aren't super deep, but they do have, um, they do go underground and then they have special adaptations that help them um, with gas exchange. And then salinity, so you would think like when we get too salty, it's not good for us, just like with our trees, if they get too salty, it's not good for them. So there are different ways that they can either block the salt from entering the tree in the first place, or if it does go into the tree, they actually can excrete it. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So I'm gonna just focus on Florida. Um, so we have three true species of mangroves here in Florida, and then, since there are some trees that are associated with the mangrove community, we have one extra one as well. And I'll touch on those in a moment. So we have about 469,000 acres of mangrove forest here in Florida. Um, and that's an guesstimate. Um, we used to have a lot more, but prior to the night, I believe it was 1996 when uh, we passed a law saying that you have to, or you're not allowed to chop down mangroves unless you have certain permission. Um, we used to have way more, but because of development and things like that, we are a little bit lower than what we used to be. Um, and like I said, it does highlight that crazy relationship between the terrestrial environment and the aquatic environment. Uh, and we will talk about why they're beneficial to us too. It's not just the ecosystem, but it actually, they benefit humans as well. Um, so zonation, this is where you'll find the red mangroves as you're at the water and then as you go upland, not really upland in Florida, but as you go away from the water line, um, each tree or each species specifies where they want to go. So they are adapted to live in the water. They're adapted to live a little bit higher up and be exposed to water. They're, some of them are adapted to not come near the water at all. Um, so as you move away from the water, you'll actually see less species depending on where you are. So the ones that we, when I think of mangroves, this is like the one I think of is the red mangroves. So if you guys look where my mouse is, the tree on the right side right here, uh, where the spoonbills are hanging out on top, the red uh, mangrove tree, that's the one that you will always see in the water. Um, and once they establish themselves, then the red, or sorry, excuse me, then the black, the white, and the buttonwood tree will then follow suit. Uh, so we're going to touch on the red mangrove today. Um, so they always will grow in and along the waters. And um, like I said, the first thing that I think of when I think of a mangrove are these guys because of those prop and drop roots. So you guys can see in this photo on the top left, those roots right there, they come out from the top of the tree and actually grow down. So we have the above water view right here. So we can see them coming down. Oh, my mouse is out of control today, there we go. And then we can see as they continue growing, they will drop down into the ocean and then we'll talk about why that's important there. You can kind of see what's happening below the water, see how things are growing on it as opposed to above the water. Um, so we'll talk about that in a moment. So these guys are really important because those roots actually help slow down wave action um, that will trap sediment, which can create islands. It also kind of stabilizes our shoreline. Um, so Florida, we are surrounded by water on three sides. Having a stabilized shoreline is extremely important, not only to us, but everything inland as well. Um, there are epibionts. So epibionts are things that living things that grow on top of things. Um, so we have these roots right here. They are alive. And then you can see on that top left photo. Sorry, give me one moment, you guys. I'm Um, sorry about that. Um, so the epibionts are things that will grow on top of it. So we'll get barnacles, we'll get algae, sponges, tunicates, um, potentially even oysters. And then all of those things create a micro community within this larger community. Um, so it's something that's really, really cool. If you've been fortunate enough to snorkel anywhere near mangrove roots, it's one of the most fascinating places in the ocean. Um, so like I said, they have ways to deal with salt. So these guys are actually salt excluders. So they don't even let the salt come into their roots at all. 
So the root membranes will actually prevent it from entering, but the water can come through, which is really interesting because they can live in soils with um, the salinity values up to like 65 parts per thousand, which is super, super salty. Um, another way to identify these guys, if you forget the prop roots, are the leaves. So they have large, waxy, elliptical shaped leaves. And the way that I was taught how to remember them is red, red, pointy head. So their leaves are gonna be a little bit more pointy towards the top than the black mangrove and the white mangrove. So you can kind of see on the photo down here on the left, um, it's a little bit pointed at the top. And then once we compare them to the white and the black, you'll be like, okay, I get it. All right, so right along. Uh, the black mangrove. So these ones will be found near the high tide line. So they will be submerged some of the time, but not always. So if it's a low tide, um, like we can see right here on this photo, all those roots will be exposed. But if the tide were to come in, then those roots will be covered. But for the most part, the tree will stay out of the water. So they have shallow, wide spreading roots um, and see those little things popping up. Those are called nematophores or dead man fingers or snorkel roots. And that is their way of helping with gas exchange. Um, so those little, they can have anywhere from up to like a thousand nematophores per tree, which is insane. Um, but again, having more of that will help them with that gas exchange. So on each of these nematophores, they have lenticels, which are raised pores that allows oxygen to go into the tree, down and around, and then release gases back into the environment. Um, they deal with salt because they are salt excretors. So remember our red mangrove were excluders. They said, we don't even want your salt, don't come in. And then the black mangrove are salt excretors. So the salt water, when it goes through, when the, when the roots pick up the salt water, they will actually push the salt water out of their leaves. So as they push that salt water out of their leaves and it evaporates because it's so toasty here in Florida and the water turns into water vapor, the salt will actually stay behind and you can find salt crystals on uh, the black mangrove leaves. So if you guys look at this bottom left photo right there, um, there are some salt crystals. If you guys were to ever find a black mangrove tree and you wanted to see if it really was a black mangrove tree, you can go ahead and lick that leaf. I've done it before. You always get weird looks, but it is very salty. One day I'm gonna start a black mangrove salt, uh, sea salt business. So if anyone wants to hop on, send me a message afterwards. Um, and the way that I remember that one is black, black salt on back. So like this one right here, you can see the salt. Um, black mangroves also are a little bit paler on the underside. So if you look at this second photo of leaves right here, we can see the top view, green, 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 green. And then the backside of this one is like a silver green sort of color. Um, and it's a little bit more rounded than our red mangrove. That's another way to tell the difference. Uh, here is a close up of those nematophores or those snorkel roots. And then you see the little bumps on there. Those are those lenticels or those raised pores. So again, just helps with that gas exchange um, as they're living in those low oxygenated soils. All right, now the white mangrove. Um, they are gonna be found far away from the water or further away from the water than the other two. They don't grow in the water at all. Uh, they don't have any visible roots like our red mangrove and our black mangrove. Uh, but they do have lenticels, so those pores along the trunk to again help with that gas exchange and get it down to the roots. Um, their leaves are a little bit different. They're actually thickened, uh, kind of like a succulent leaf. And um, what they do is they also excrete salt. Now, I was taught something not right, which I learned doing this presentation, which is super cool. Um, but for our white, leaf, our white mangrove leaves, um, the way I remember is white, white bolts on tight. So if you look at the bottom, of this leaf right here, where the leaf meets the stem, there are two little bolts, uh, kind of like Frankenstein on the side of his neck. And I was taught that that is where they excrete salt. And re um, doing this presentation and learning a little bit more about mangroves, I learned that that was not true at all. Um, so they actually don't excrete salt through these glands right there. The salt glands are all here. So if you can see these, uh, oh no, there we go. If you can see these dots, going along the length of the leaf on both sides. Boom, 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 boom. I just highlighted that with my mouse. Um, that is actually where they will excrete the salt from. Those are the salt glands. Now these two down here are extra floral nectaries. And scientists think they're not, it's not 100% confirmed, but they, the leading theory for why these guys have them is that they will release sugar on, out of those nectaries, which will attract ants, which will then prevent 
herb, uh, herbivores from eating the leaves, which I just think is insane because I, I think nature is just so cool. So this was really fun for me to learn because I was taught it was something else, but there is a purpose to it, which is to protect itself, which is super cool. Uh, so like I said, the salt glands are gonna be along the leaf right here. And then these two bolts at the bottom are going to be extra floral nectaries, uh, which again, uh, attracts ants to uh, protect himself from other predators. All right, so those are our three true mangroves here in Florida. And then our fourth, I'll put quotes around it, mangrove. Um, not a true mangrove, but since it's found in this community, it's associated with mangroves. The last one's gonna be the buttonwood. Um, so not a true mangrove, it is found usually near the white mangroves, if not higher. And it's that transition zone um, from like coastal environment to upland community. So the reason why it's called a buttonwood is that um, it's right down here. It looks like a bunch of buttons gathered together. Um, so that is going to be their flower heads right there. Um, and I will talk about reproduction in a moment, but they also can excrete salt just like our other trees. Um, so they also have two glands at the base of each leaf. Um, so not like this one, not the extra floral nectaries, but they also have two glands down there. Um, their leaves are a little bit different. They're a little bit rougher, more leather-like and uh, pointed. So similar to our red mangroves where they're pointed at the top. Um, but these guys are really cool because true mangrove leaves occur opposite of each other, whereas buttonwood leaves alternate. So true mangroves will go one here, one here, whereas the buttonwood would be like one down, one up, one down, one up. That's another way to tell the difference. All right, so these guys are also unique because of their reproductive strategy. Um, they are, they're just funky trees in general, uh, but they actually are viviparous. So viviparous has to do, um, means live birth. So the offspring begins to develop while attached to the parent. Now, one group of animals that is very well known for um, vivipary are mammals. So we give live birth, right? Um, so the fetus will hang out in the mother's uterus for nine months and then we, uh, the mom will give birth. So it's kind of crazy that a tree has the same reproductive strategy as we do. I just think it's amazing. Um, so we're gonna talk about vivipary. We'll talk about how they're able to do it. Um, and then we'll talk about how they, once the seeds drop, how they go from there. Um, so flowers are pollinated and then the mangrove produces seeds that immediately begins to germinate into seedlings which are called propagules which then drop into the water. So on the top left right here, we have our red mangrove propagules. They are long, kind of finger-like, um, also kind of looks like cigars. If you were to go out on the beach right now, that's probably gonna be the most common one you see um, just because they're so large and there are so many red mangroves and it's just easier to find them because they're bigger. Um, right down here on the bottom left, these are actually black mangrove propagules. Uh, so they kind of look like enlarged lima beans, I think. Um, you can find them on the beach, but I don't find them as often as I find the red mangroves. And then on the bottom right are gonna be the white uh, mangrove propagules. I think I have found one in my entire mangrove propagule searching existence. Um, so they are a little bit trickier to find, especially if you don't know what you're looking for. They're small, probably about the size of a pea, if not a little bit bigger. Um, so we got the red on the top left, the black mangrove on the bottom left, and then the white on the bottom right. Uh, so once they drop those seeds, what's really cool about these guys is that they don't want to outcompete one another, right? So if they if the seed were to drop right next to the parent plant, that then they could uh, compete for resources. Maybe one would kind of uproot the other, things like that. So their reproductive strategy allows them to drop the seeds in the water, and then the water as the tides come in and out, if there's a current, things like that, will actually take the propagules or those seeds away from the parent and allows them to spread out and kind of increases their range. Um, it can, depending on the tree, it can float and stay in that water and be viable for a certain amount of time. So the red mangrove, once that propagule drops into the ocean, it could actually survive in the ocean for up to a year and still take root and start a new tree. So up to 365 days. The black mangrove is a little bit shorter. Um, it has about 110 days before it's no longer viable. And then the white mangrove has up to 24 days. So if it doesn't reach the bottom and start growing in 24 days, then unfortunately that one's no longer viable. But still a really cool strategy just to kind of get away from the parent tree to help kind of the whole community survive and not compete with one another. 
All right, so threats. Why do we care about mangroves? What's going on in the world right now? So um, they once covered about 75% of the world's tropical coastlines. We know a lot of people live along the coast. Um, so because these trees aren't necessarily aesthetically pleasing to some people, um, before we realized how important they were, we would chop them down so that we could build along the coast, um, whether it's homes, infrastructure, things like that. So about half of the world's mangroves have been destroyed or cleared for agriculture, agriculture, urban development, or other infrastructure. Oh, and I was right with the year. So in 1996, they, uh, Florida passed the Mangrove Trimming and Preservation Act, uh, which makes it illegal to remove, destroy, or damage mangroves. Um, there is a little asterisk there because if you have permission and you have someone specific who is, they have a specific certification for mangrove removal, and you have approval from the state, then you are allowed to remove the mangroves. But it's a very special case for you to get it removed in the first place. Um, the reason why in 1996 that it passed was right before, I think it was 94, 94, 95 was a really active hurricane season for Florida. And we lost a lot of shoreline from all of the wave action. So, which is the good thing with humans and nature is that when we make mistakes, we most of the time learn from it um, and we make changes. So that's kind of what happened here. Um, so deforestation is a huge threat to them. Climate change is also a threat. So sea level rise. Um, so as our polar ice caps melt, that is adding more fresh water into our ocean, which is going to change the salinity A, but also increase the water level as well. Um, aquaculture, which is gonna be this photo on the bottom left, um, it has become more popular within the last, I want to say 20 years, 20 ish years. Um, but aquaculture is growing aquatic animals, usually fish or shrimp, in an area. Um, so, in the last decade, about 35% of mangroves were destroyed to create um, shrimp farms specifically. Uh, and usually it's over in the uh, Indo Pacific, over near Asia. Uh, we do have them here in the US as well. We have both shrimp farms and fish farms. Um, and because we are knocking down these mangroves to then put all of these animals in a small enclosed area and raise them and then sell them, that is causing a whole bunch of issues, uh, not only for the product that you will eventually be consuming, but also that local ecosystem there. Um, another issue that they are facing is pollution. Um, so because they are found near estuaries where a river releases into the ocean, that river is coming from inland somewhere. So that's gonna pick up everything inland and then drag it down the river and deposit it into the ocean. So we have fertilizers, pesticides, oil spills, actual trash, things like that. So you get the usual threats to all the things. Um, why should we care about them? Why, like, why do we care if there are threats to them? Mangals, which are mangrove forests, are ecosystem engineers, which means that they form their own ecosystem and provide habitat for a variety of organisms. So those prop and drop roots from that red mangrove tree, this is an underwater view right here. So we can see, and we'll ignore the fish for the moment, but we can see all along the roots right here, that's algae growing. And we know algae is the base of the food web, right? Um, so this will attract things that eat algae. Then the next level, trophic level, will begin to settle on there. So like I said, barnacles, tunicates, sponges, things like that. These roots form a micro community within this larger community. Now let's talk about the big guys. So fish, those roots, they're, those are tiny little fish. That is a great spot for them to hang out for multiple reasons. One, all the snacks that are hanging out on the roots for them to eat. And two, something bigger that wants to eat those fish might not be able to maneuver themselves within those roots, right? So those roots are actually a nursery for juvenile fish and shellfish here, especially here in Florida. About 90% of commercially important fish and 70% of sport fish in Florida rely on mangroves at some point in their lifetime, specifically when they're young. Um, fun fact, $7.6 billion seafood industry in Florida employs about 109,000 people. So this is something that we want to protect, right? Because not only is it helping our environment, but it's also helping our local economy as well. Um, the loss of one square mile, square mile of mangoes is a loss of 275,000 pounds of fish per year. So again, these guys are so, so, so important. Um, like I said, not just for the environment, but for humans as well. And another cool thing, because they are these micro communities, they also recycle nutrients back into the food web. Um, so specifically those red mangroves, when the trees, uh, when the leaves die, they drop right down into the ocean, right? So they sink down to the bottom and they eventually become detritus or dead organic matter. 
Now, decomposers, both on land and in the ocean, have a very important job because they break down that dead matter and then recycle nutrients back into the food web. Um, those trees, as they're along the water, um, especially in those gentle bay areas where the estuary is, uh, they are also breeding grounds for birds. Um, especially here in Florida, we are a migratory hotspot. We're a great spot for birds to stop over, um, get some rest, get some snacks, maybe have some babies, that sort of thing. Um, these areas are really important for those breeding grounds. And like I said, we need them too. It's not just, it's good for the environment, but it's good for us too. Like I said, they stabilize the shoreline. So those roots will trap the sediment uh, because it's a constant battle between land and ocean of where that sand's gonna be, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have been out to the beach lately, but the topography has changed so much uh, because of all the cold fronts we've been getting. It's been changing what the shoreline looks like here in Hollywood. Um, this is probably like the longest I've seen it in a while. Whereas back in November, because of all the wave action, our beach was pretty eroded. Um, so it's constantly changing. It's that constant battle. So mangroves just kind of help trap that sediment and just help keep our shorelines a little bit more stable. It protects from waves, wind, floods, things like that. Every 330 feet of mangroves can reduce wave action by up to 66%, which is insane. And again, since we are surrounded by water on three sides and during the hurricane season, we're usually on high alert. This is really important for us to help kind of protect uh, the inland communities. Um, mangroves are also carbon sinks which means that they capture excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, store them underground in the soil, and then it becomes part of the blue carbon cycle. Um, so that is carbon that is buried underwater in coastal ecosystems for hundreds and hundreds of years. That means that there is less carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, which means that our planet won't heat up as quickly, which means that hopefully everything will be okay. Uh, worldwide, mangroves sequester 28 million tons of carbon every year. Um, and like I said, it's really important because those greenhouse gases uh, accelerate climate change. One acre of mango can sequester 1,450 pounds of carbon every year. So these guys are super, super important for us because we need a planet to survive, right? We need a healthy functioning planet to survive. Um, mangroves are also natural filters, which means that they can help water quality by taking out toxins from that water. So here in Florida, a lot of our agriculture land is in the center of the state. Um, and as farmers put fertilizers and pesticides and things on their crops to help grow, when it rains, rain hits those plants, takes those chemicals, runs downhill to our rivers. And remember, all rivers eventually lead into the ocean, taking everything along with them. Uh, so that means pollution, uh, lots of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphate, which are found in fertilizers, and other pollutants could end up in our waterways. Um, if we have too much nitrogen and too much phosphate, that could cause algal blooms, which that's a whole nother topic and I don't have enough time to get on that. Uh, but basically we need these guys. They are super important for us, for the planet, for everything. Um, and also ecotourism, right? Until you have that emotional connection with something, until you go out and see it with your eyes and you have this amazing experience where you're paddleboarding between the mangrove forest and all of a sudden you see a spotted eagle, right? Jump out of the water. It's like, what? How is this planet this cool? Getting involved, like getting out there, seeing these ecosystems, seeing these species is really important because once you make that emotional connection to it, you're going to change your behavior because you're like, oh, that was a great day when that eagle ray jumped by me. Or, oh my gosh, I saw two dolphins swimming by me. It was so great. But these environments are necessary because that's where these guys live. Um, ecotourism also supports the local economy um, and it's a sustainable and safe way to get those up hand and or up close and first hand experiences. Maybe one second, we're gonna let this helicopter pass. All right. So like I said, they protect wave action. They can stop wave action for, or stop wave energy up to 66%. So this was a really cool video that just shows you what a line of mangroves will do for the coastline. So we see wave action, wave action, wave action. The first couple mangroves, yeah, okay, they're taking the brunt of the storm, but you know, everyone's got to, got to make some sacrifices. But then look at how calm and still the water is at the end there. So they absorb that energy, they protect that coastline. And being surrounded by water, very important that our coastline stays intact. And then here is just an overall graphic of all the different components. Uh, because mangroves are found in estuaries, estuaries are the top three, or one of the top three most productive ecosystems on earth. Uh, there are so many components that are 
to get or that come together to form a functioning uh, estuary. And mangroves are a really big part of it. Um, so we can see as we settle along the coast, uh, living right by the water, what we're doing has an effect on everything around us, um, but how we can not only help our local buildings and local environment, but all the terrestrial animals that need areas like this, all the aquatic animals that need areas like this and things like that. Oh, all right. Oh, that was kind of quick. Normally I have so much to say. Does anybody have any questions? Is there any, oh, Elliot wants to know, is there anything that we can take from the mangroves method of desalination that could help us do better in our desalination methods? Ah, you know, I don't see why not because we, we do copy a lot of things because nature, if, if you don't know, they, nature has everything figured out. It is a complex puzzle, but it has all of the pieces fit together, right? And if everything is functioning properly, it's good to go. Usually the puzzle gets a little wonky when humans get involved, right? Because we alter things, we add things, we change things, we need things. So nature is just always trying to catch up with what we're doing. Um, so I bet, I bet we could learn from them because nature is always right. Um, but I don't know if any research has been in, has looked at that. Huh, huh, I don't know. Elliot, I'm gonna get back to you. I'm gonna do some research and I'm gonna get back to you. How about that? All right. Uh, what other sharks beside lemon sharks use mangroves as nurseries? Oh, fantastic question. Um, so think of your smaller sharks. So think of your bonnet heads, your nurse sharks, things like that. The smaller sharks that probably would get picked off by the bigger sharks, that's where they wanna hang out in because they can catch prey easily, they can hide easily and things like that. Um, so here I would say the bonnet heads and the nurse sharks, probably sand sharks as well, they're pretty tiny. Um, but yeah, anything kind of small on the smaller end of sharks will hang out near estuaries. Can many mangroves stop a tsunami? Ooh, I'm gonna go with no. Just because, so a tsunami is caused by an underground earthquake and then that is a whole, oh, give me one second. Got a lot of air traffic today. All right. Um, so because a tsunami is caused by an underground earthquake, that is a lot of energy and tsunamis are really, really, really large waves. I don't know if it could necessarily protect, can stop a tsunami. It could probably slow it down a little bit, um, but I don't think it would, unless you had like, gosh, I would say miles thick of mangrove forest. But because a tsunami has so much energy from that underground earthquake, I don't think mangroves would be able to stop it but don't rule it out. Uh, Taylor wants to know, what's one easy way we can all help protect our mangroves? <sighs> Where to begin? Do, do, do. So um, cutting your carbon emissions, limiting your pollution, things like that, um, cleaning up debris, making sure, share this information, right? Because until, like if you're not from Florida, if you're not living in Florida, if you're not exposed to these things, you might not learn about them, right? So all the fun facts that you learn from all these webinars that you go to, share them with people. Because A, who doesn't love fun facts? And B, who knows, maybe down the line when someone goes to Florida or they see mangroves, they're like, wait a minute, I remember these cool trees. We should love them because they do so many great things for us. <laughs> yes, I am uninvited to game night. Yes, we can't have everything, Taylor. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Is there any, anyone out there planting slash replanting mangroves? Yes. Um, there are a whole bunch of organizations in Florida that actually do outreach programs with schools. Right now, I'm not quite sure what's happening just because of everything going on in the world and being remote and whatnot. Um, I do know the Tampa Bay Watch, um, which is over in Tampa Bay, uh, and the Tampa Bay Discovery Center they do a lot of restoration work over there where they will actually take the red mangrove propagules, um, those long cigar shaped ones, once they're, they'll leave them in water, once the roots start coming out uh, from the bottom so that they're able to settle, they will then go out with classes and plant them into the ecosystem. Um, you could, in theory, do it yourself as well. Um, if you were to find, actually don't take my word for that, but hypothetically, if you were to find propagules, you leave them in water, they start rooting or start sprouting. In theory, if you got 
permission and or it was okay to go put them in an area where mangroves are. I don't see why there would be a problem with that. Uh, one of the places I used to work at, we had a cool little mangrove tank where we collected all of them. Same thing that Tampa Bay Watch does. We collected all of them, had them as a display at first. So we actually were able to have the roots grow a little bit and then we showed the micro communities. So we had, um, I always forget their names, but mosquito fish, I know it starts with a G. Uh, we had them in there. We had algae in there. We actually had seahorses in there from um, when we were able to go out in the seagrass and catch them and put them in there, things like that, just to show how much biodiversity is found in that ecosystem. Um, and then once the mangroves started growing too large for that tank, we then had a outreach program with one of the groups that we worked with and we planted them out uh, along the San Carlos Bay in Fort Myers. So yeah, good question. Does anybody else have any other questions? It could be about mangroves, it could be about ocean things, it could be about what my other two favorite trees are. I did say it was my third favorite tree and nobody asked me what my other two favorite ones were. Yeah, go ahead, type it in, Taylor. <laughs> okay, my first favorite tree are sequoia trees, just because obviously they're amazing and massive and so cool, but their root structure is insane. Um, so they don't have very deep roots, they have horizontal roots, and they actually start, their roots will start intertwining with all of their neighbors. So they kind of form a community and they have each other's backs in a way. So they will help share nutrients and resources and water and things like that. They won't really outcompete one another because they know uh, strength in numbers, right? So if they have more healthy trees, that's a really good thing. Give me one second. Okay. And my second favorite tree, even though technically it's not a tree, it's technically a grass, um, are palm trees. And if you guys just saw the article of uh, the three people who were stranded on a deserted island in the Bahamas, I've been saying it for years, all I would need is a coconut palm tree and I'd be good to go. And they proved it right because they survived for 33 days. So that would be my second one. And then mangroves definitely are third. Actually, no, I take that back. I'm kicking out the coconut palm. I don't want that one anymore. I like Norfolk pines. They're really cool trees, look them up. We have them here in Florida. Um, they can grow super, super tall, like hundreds of feet tall. Oh, I have a, one fun fact for you guys. Does or, or a question, and you get bonus points if you get it right. Does anybody know? Well, don't Google it either. Okay, no googling. This is just using your brain. Does anybody know how old the oldest living tree on Earth is right now? Take a guess. There are no wrong answers. Well, there are, but I won't yell at you if they're wrong. And don't Google. That's cheating. So how many years has this tree been around on earth? Oh, Elliot, you're so good at this game. Yes, it is about 5,071 years. Um, they won't tell you where the tree is, obviously, uh, but they're able to age the tree by taking a core. So they'll drill a little bit into it, drill to the center, pull it out. And because we know that trees, as they age, they leave rings, um, because these, this tree is so old, the rings are so small that they actually have to put the core underneath a microscope to then count all of the lines. Um, yeah, yeah, trees can, yeah, trees live forever. Uh, if you guys wanna learn more about just trees in general from someone more knowledgeable and more exciting than I am, which I know, hard to beat, but check out the Ologies podcast with Allie Ward. Um, the episode was called Dendrologies with this guy, Casey Clapp. And, he he was just so excited about trees. It made me excited about trees, which I mean, it's not that hard to do. I get excited about most things, but he check it out. Super fun. Yeah. All right. I think that's all I have today. Very cool. Well, if anyone does think of any questions um, that they didn't get to ask now, um, or if they just want to tell us what they think of that cast recommendation, feel free to email us at meek, M-E-E-C at nova.edu. Um, very cool presentation, Carly. I know you were super excited about this one. We wow. are trying to put together a more new programs. So if you have a specific request, please email us, meek at nova.edu. Um, otherwise, we are going to be having, I think four new programs are pretty solid right now. Um, so we'll have a total of 18, 20. We should have done this math before the presentation. We should have. I think it's 16. 16, okay. 
Um, so we'll have 16. But I can go for 20 if you want. Sounds we'll like for 20, just a okay. nice 20. Fine, um, challenge accepted. So we do need recommendations. So email us or uh, DM us on our social medias. Um, otherwise, if you were interested in a private program for your school group, Girl Scout group, homeschool group, Boy Scout troop, any of the things. Um, or age. just yeah. if you're, you have a big family and you guys just want to learn about mangroves privately, uh, email us at me. <laughs> um, we do private programs as well. Um, and we can sort of tailor the programs as necessary. Um, otherwise, next week, uh, we are doing the webinar again, Saturday from one to two. Um, and we are actually going to be having one of our very own interns do a presentation. Um, he's been working on it since he started the internship uh, beginning of last semester. So he's all excited about it. It is the Everglades program. Um, so for those of you who are from Florida, you know how important our Florida Everglades are to us. Um, and he is going to be teaching us a little bit about what he has learned and experienced since coming to Florida. Um, otherwise, keep an eye on our social media for any future scheduling. And if you missed any of this program, we did record it, we will edit it, and we'll post it to our YouTube channel.